It represents a great moment in motorsports history, uh, one that has a slightly sad tinge, but nonetheless, I think it's about honoring history and the people that make it. And this is a car that does exactly that. If we can have our volunteers take their positions at the car. Go crazy, guys. <laughs> we'll try. We'll try. You know? It's so hard to do. <laughs> All set? This one the 1963 Cooper Monaco King Cobra. <laughs> this is a car that was developed by Carroll Shelby because he needed a sports car that was more capable than the front engine cars that he was running at the time. He did not have a mid-engine car ready to go, and his drivers, who were incredibly capable crew, needed a weapon that could attack in the sports racing class <laughs> yeah. more effectively. And this car was driven by Dave McDonald, a great driver who unfortunately never got to realize the incredible potential of his career. He was a brilliant driver. Everyone acknowledged him as a star of the future, who after winning the race in Kent, Washington, in this car, he then went to Indianapolis to compete in the 500, where he was killed in an accident on the first lap. So this rep car represents the absolute apathy of his career, a brilliant career, and also what sports racing was really like in the mid 1960s. And uh, I'd like to have a word from uh, Jake about these cars, because I know that you are a big Shelby fan. Well, this is an era when uh, America, we won World War II, we were the richest country in the world. We flew windshields to Le Mans for the race, and somehow we were the underdog against the the Italian company was worth $10 million, and Ford was a $10 billion company, but we were always the underdog. But this was, this was a car built by Hot Rodders, which is kind of fun. All the Southern California guys helped contribute to build this car, and many of them are still around to this day. So it makes it kind of cool. It gives a kind of a personal touch, you know, it makes you feel like, because so much of F1 and everything is beyond the scope of the normal person in terms of engineering, and the, whereas this is something that, Get a guy that can weld, get a guy that can build, and, and you make a race car, you know? And that's, it has that home-built special kind of feel, even though it's extremely sophisticated. And that's, that's what makes it, it's an American engine. Uh, that, that's the 289, right? Yes. yes. The 289, which is my favorite, com 289 with Weber's on it, which is my favorite combination. I, I, I enjoy looking at the crowd because, guys, you know how you go to the mall and you have to sit while your wife is trying on shoes? This is what it's like for them, yeah. <laughs> They're sitting going, okay, how long is this gonna last? Yeah. Honey, those shoes look great, yeah, yeah. Yeah, get those ones, you know. So I see, I, I, I look at these female blank faces. <sighs> how much longer is this gonna be? I don't care about a 289. But to some of us of a certain age, this was the car that combined European sophistication with American, good old American hot rodding and a V8 and a four speed and everything that we thought was cool coming up. I mean, now it would seem, of course, incredibly crude, but in the day, it really was just the, the ultimate weapon. It was really an amazing, amazing automobile. A very potent weapon, I know. Uh, Zach, you have an amazing collection of race cars of all types, and uh, I know that race cars that were assembled with British chassis and American engines, the whole idea of combining technologies and nationality is something that you're very familiar with. Well, very much so, but I think what impresses me most about this era of cars were the drivers. And, I mean, look at it now. It doesn't look particularly safe. Um, and and Dave, would, Dave would know, he's driven it. And, uh, I mean, they were unbelievably quick. And when you watch the drivers from this era, um, the way they had to move the car, pivot the car around the corner to, to get a maximum lap time, uh, they were very... Uh, very brave, and uh, it's a beautiful car, and it's always awesome to see history brought back to to life. And uh, great that Audra has such an uh, an eclectic group of, of cars, from Formula One cars. To, I mean, you've got everything, uh, and so just great to see this uh, come back to life. Well, speaking of the experience of driving this car, its debut after a three-year restoration was at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. And David Donahue, championship sports car driver, had the honor of driving it up the, up the hill. So what was that like, David?
old, so how fast could it be? We, we, we started it up, and just before you even put it in here, I knew there was something serious. It just sounds like an animal. It, it is really quick, really quick. It only weighs 1,100 pounds. Um, the uh, metal workers were telling me some of the work they were doing, they were cutting the wind with the scissors. Uh, it's that thin. Um, that you can't push the car anywhere because it just just put a hand on it. We were surrounded by fuel cells, so uh, he talked to Peter Brock about when he was building it. And, and, uh, I kept asking him where was safety in, in his mind when he was putting this thing together. And it definitely was not. Uh, you come to a stop, it's one of those cars you come to a stop and it rocks back and forth because the fuel is sloshing back and forth. And you realize that it's on both sides of you. Uh, so, yeah, it's a step on the brake. And, it's kind of like sticking on a big piece of wood, and nothing really happens, but... So, so yeah, it's really scary. <laughs> And one of the other uh, challenges of restoring the car was also, with any race car and any race car restoration, you have to pick a moment in time to celebrate. And you have to look at the history of the car, figure out how much of the car is there for the period you want to uh, celebrate. And that was one of the great challenges and one of the uh, things that uh, the restoration team, led by Lee Castleberry, uh, really did a lot of research in to, to find out exactly what the car looked like, what the equipment was like, even down to the stickers that the car ran at that race in 1964. And so, have you ever driven a car like this, Jay? No, not like this. I, I love the fact that that is the original car. Uh, that's a blue, I don't know why we don't see that blue, it's such a beautiful, beautiful color. And uh, race cars don't look like this anymore, one solid color without, most of them going down, it's, it's got McDonald's and Tampax and everything else all over, you know. Whereas this, it's just the, the single auto lights, there. it's just fantastic. It really looks, this is the golden age of racing, it really was that time when, when, when race cars resembled road cars. You could, you could have the same engine as the race car, you know. Exactly, and little boys and girls could draw a race car. They've never, never seen one, and they would draw something that looks exactly like this. Yeah. One of those little boys is standing right here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Jay, you want to drive it today? Yeah, I would love to drive it today, yeah. So this is an extraordinary car, and again, a tribute to uh, our mission here at the Audrain to preserve, celebrate, and share automotive history. And you'll learn a lot more about the history of this car uh, when we put it on exhibition uh, in an upcoming show. And uh, hopefully you'll also be able to see it in another demonstration as soon as uh, David recovers from having driven it at Goodwood. You can take it out on the track. Well, you know, the fascinating part, you realize, this is just about the halfway mark in the history of race cars. Go from about 1910 to about 1963, and then from 63 to now. So this is really the halfway point. And that's, that's kind of an exciting thing to me. This, this is how far we had come. Because if you went 50 years earlier, oh my God, this is the most primitive car in the world. So this must have seemed like a spaceship. In the same way it seems so antiquated now compared to the modern stuff. But it's just that milestone, that, that halfway point to where we are today. It's also a bit of a transition car because it's from and uh, Lee, just tell us about what uh, sort of the, the biggest single challenge that you had in trying to figure out how to re re restore the car and rebuild it and make it uh, safe and usable. Well, yeah, after discussing with Dave about safety, we didn't talk to Dave anymore just to make sure he drove it, but uh, he enjoyed driving. However, the biggest challenge was just agreeing on delivery. I felt really strongly about this delivery, and we all discussed it. It was a big decision to determine which delivery we would create. But this is a big deal. And the thing about that is, unfortunately, at day eight dollar, that was when things, as far as safety concerned, really started to evolve. As we all know, all safety rules and equipment and everything is already in play because this is a habit. They make another change, and this was kind of the beginning of that. But this was kind of a lost era of racing. Where there were no sanctions, there were no sanctions in the body because everything was new. Like you said, it was a commercial streetcar. This was their first purpose built race car in America. You know, to me, the fun thing about 
this event is we honor the men and women like Lee who restored these cars. In the same way, if you like paintings, there are guys that restore the old masters. And it's the same thing, you know, 50 years ago, it just would have been a mechanic and you did a quick, quick paint job. Now you're a, re a restorer, you know. We have colleges like McPherson College where kids go to college and get a degree in this kind of thing. And they talk to guys like Lee and find out how it was done. And so they can make it 100%. Because I remember restoration jobs back in the 70s, you should have three black walls and one white wall tire, you know, because nothing else was available. Now we have the means and their cars are so valuable, we can put them back to exactly w what they were, you know, and that's what makes it cool. And I think it's great that we honor guys like, like this who kind of behind the scenes do all the work. And how about a nice hand for Lee? Just an amazing job. The level of detail, I mean, down to the fact that Lee did great uh, historical research, down to the fact that the uh, spoiler had just been put on at that race, and they hadn't painted it yet because they just fixed it to the car, and that's exactly the way Lee made it for the car. And those are Arthur Ashe's tennis balls right there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, courtesy of the International Tennis Hall of Fame, yes, yes. we have the uh, championship winning tennis balls uh, in the air tanks as well. Well, thank you very much, and please, everyone, enjoy this wonderful bit of racing history here at the gathering. Thank you.